Pope Francis. The Meteorological Service has downgraded the flash flood warning to a flash flood watch for low-lying and flood-prone areas of northeastern and southeastern parishes, including St. Mary, Portland, St. Thomas, Kingston and St. Andrew, St. Catherine, Clarendon, Manchester, St. Elizabeth and Westmoreland. The Met Office has continued the flash flood watch for low-lying and flood-prone areas of Hanover, St. James, Trelawney and St. Anne, effective until 5 Friday afternoon. Satellite imagery and rainfall reports indicate that the outer bands of tropical depression ETA continues to generate cloudy conditions across the island, with light to moderate rainfall and isolated thunderstorms, mainly across sections of northeastern and southern parishes. Residents of Coley and the surrounding areas are calling for a temporary structure until the bridge that connects them to Cedar Valley and Morant Bay St. Thomas is completed. Our news team visited the construction site on Thursday and filed this report. River Couriers. It's a new way to taxi goods between communities on either side of the Morant River. Some residents are paying to have their goods brought across the river. The bridge that connects the communities along the Morant River has been under construction, but work has been delayed due to the heavy rains and rising river waters below. Residents of Coley have now resorted to trekking through the riverbed to conduct their business elsewhere. It's a dangerous risk. I think this is too long. What we are seeing here, persons have to be crossing the river in order to reach to Trinityville, Cedar Valley, and we are of this situation and yes we understand that it is affecting the whole of Jamaica but at the same time if this bridge wasn't removed the persons here would be, wouldn't be suffering like this so we need some assistance. We need also to consider the, the, the persons who might have emergency cases and supplies to come into the village. We are saying that the, 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 the situation, this inconvenience has happened uh, like more than three times in the recent past. One of the, after the other, in weeks, we have experienced this. And we want to know if this is going to continue. Uh, we would suggest that, that they put a, a Bailey Bridge or something of the sort beside the present structure so that we don't have to be experiencing this. Right now, our people life in danger. A lot of people. I'll be somebody I'll really wash right here, so. Yeah, man. So what we see them are the idiot thing. They have to put some big calvert in our place. A few evenings ago, one van was washed away and the business person lost a lot of goods. The bridge, located along the Trinityville Main Road, was washed away during heavy rains in August. The authorities have been working to restore it since then. This elderly resident had an alternative solution. The Englishman was wise of making a free flow bridge and now they have made a box calvert. That signifies that they are not sensitive who have make this box candle. But the river here need a free flow bridge that the water carry the debris, carry the stone, carry the silt, everything can pass through. And this is not wise. This is a foolish plan that has been drawn by anyone. And I am very sorry to understand that Jamaica, is, that we are suffering right now. I'm living in Fountain and the people upstairs Cedar Valley truly been, been suffering, up to the common dead, been suffering. The area of Coley is just one of several communities being hampered by the flooding and landslides in St. Thomas. National Works Agency says teams are working to clear affected roadways of silt and debris. There is no word yet on when the new bridge in Trinityville will be completed. Melvin Pennant, PBCJ News. Residents in low-line and flood-prone areas have been taking steps to prevent loss of life, including this resident who lives in the community of Pasma, who says the recent rains flooded her yard. When the rain and fall, I have to walk from bridge going on my house. Because it be a rain, last night I have to sleep on somebody's yard. To the rain and fall, be a water, a river in my yard. When the rain fall, and last night it stay bad. In recent days, the number of COVID-19 cases across the island has trended downward. Chief Medical Officer Jacqueline Bessesa-McKenzie is, however, urging caution. Where we saw that we had a peak 
at about the end of August, uh, plateauing over the month of September, we can see that for the month of October, we have been consistently trending downwards. Now, I just want to say that the epidemiological curve gives us an idea of trends. It does not give us absolute numbers of what is happening in the country because the curves are always, you know, the tip of the iceberg that we are seeing. And while it is that we note that we are seeing a trend down at present, we still have to remain in a position of high alert and caution um, as we approach what is going to be a very busy time of the year, the Christmas season. The 14-day curfew in the Raytown community in St. Andrew ends today, November 6. The curfew order was imposed on October 23 to curtail the spread of COVID-19 in that area. In terms of Raytown, we are very encouraged. 773 householders visited, 1,062 persons reached, 1,249 pieces of IEC material distributed, that is public education material, 112 samples taken with zero positives and no results pending. So Raytown looks very encouraging and thanks to the citizens for their cooperation and the team on the ground. It does point to a direction where we could lift or certainly recommend the lifting of the quarantine measures and that's positive. So we, we, we're in a good place as it relates to Raytown. The Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization, says based on Jamaica's population, the target number of blood units by the National Blood Transfusion Service should be 50,000. Since the first positive case of COVID-19 in Jamaica on March 10, 2020, blood donations reportedly fell sharply due to fears by some donors about their safety. With the current COVID-19 pandemic, dengue and flu season, Jamaica is even more dependent on donors to assist with providing blood and blood products like platelets that are made from blood which are needed by the body to help with the clotting of the blood if there is bleeding. On Friday, November 6, Minister of State and the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Juliet Cuthbert Flynn, officially launched a blood drive organized by the National Blood Transfusion Services and the Massey United Insurance Company. You know, it's not a big culture for us here in Jamaica to donate blood. And I want Jamaicans to possibly understand the importance of this um, because we don't want to just have donations only when there is a crisis happening, like COVID-19 and when the dengue season is upon us because patients are always needing blood in our hospitals. She urged all eligible Jamaicans to become a voluntary blood donor. The transfusion of blood and blood products have saved thousands of lives in Jamaica, and every donation helped to save three lives. You hear that? Three lives from one blood donation. Although many persons may be afraid to donate during the COVID-19 infections, that, co that, if that continues to increase in the country, donors should be encouraged and assured that the necessary safety protocols are in place at blood collection centers. Jamaica needs enough blood for everyone that has a need. And last year, Jamaica collected close to 35,000 units. This is an opportune time for all of us to consider our family, friends, and community and make a concerted effort to donate and help to save lives. A Jamaica Health and Lifestyle Survey shows that one out of every eight Jamaicans suffer from diabetes. Diabetes is the second leading cause of death for Jamaicans under the age of 70. Additionally, approximately 10,000 children in Jamaica under the age of 15 are said to be suffering from diabetes. Diabetes is also a leading cause of damage to the heart and can cause end organ damage, including loss of toes and limbs. In fact, it is the second leading cause of loss of limbs in Jamaica and the Caribbean following car accidents. November is recognized as Diabetes Awareness Month. 
The Ministry of Health and Wellness is urging all Jamaicans to take responsibility for their mental health and nutrition in the management of diabetes. As we turn the spotlight on diabetes this November, we must acknowledge the scale of the problem of non-communicable diseases facing us and redouble our efforts to solve it, drawing on all our resources, including our nurses, who are essential not only as healthcare providers, but also as professionals on whom we can rely for the promotion of self-care management among patients. The Ministry will be championing the cause of persons living with diabetes. We have updated our clinical management guidelines which is now available on our website, and we will be working on increasing access to testing through the introduction of point-of-care testing. This methodology of testing is the gold standard for monitoring and control of diabetes. Our agency, the National Health Fund, will continue to support persons through the provision of diabetic medication and supplies, and I encourage persons with diabetes to enroll in, this, in, in the NHF card program to access this, this benefit. Delegates of the People's National Party go to the polls on Saturday, November 7, to elect their sixth president. Over 3,000 delegates are registered to vote. The post of party president is being contested by St. Anne Southeast Member of Parliament, Lisa Hannah Lake, and Member of Parliament for St. Andrew South, Mark Golding. Voting will be done at 12 locations, beginning at 10 in the morning and ending at 3 in the afternoon. The Electoral Office of Jamaica says the party will be informed of the results by 5 in the afternoon. Cattle owners not registered with the National Animal Identification and Traceability System, NATS, by January 31, 2021, will not be able to move their animals freely from one farm to another or to slaughterhouses. We hear more about this mandatory system from our reporter Marlon Samuels. Virulent diseases such as foot and mouth disease can wipe out Jamaica's livestock sector. It is known that a large percentage of infectious diseases are pretty much of animal origin, uh, um, perhaps more than 60% of infectious diseases of our, our of animal origin. And further, 75% of the diseases that you hear um, emerging these days are of animal origin. So for example, the COVID-19 um, and um, SARS, dengue, malaria, several if you go Ebola, avian influenza, Zika, a lot of them can be traced back to animals and um, not just animal um, which perhaps are domesticated, but you have the practice of persons going into the wild. So hunters may go into the wild in countries to hunt for wild animals and what's happening in the wild. In the wild, you do have virus, several viruses, bacteria, and other organisms that the animals there, they actually can um, coexist with. But when it gets out into our situation, um, we are vulnerable and um, we get infected. This is just one of several reasons why the government of Jamaica sees the necessity of a mandatory animal identification and traceback system. Cattle owners who plan to transport their animals from their farms to slaughterhouses or even to another farm will face challenges if they do not register under the National Identification and Traceback System by January 31, 2021. Information on the herd of origin and individual animal identification for cattle is included in the system, which some refer to as a passport. A goal of the system is the ability to track back, in short order, all livestock in the event of a disease emergency. You must have a workable animal identification and traceability system because when you purchase a pound of beef in the, in the, in the, in the zoo market, you need to know where it came from. So should there be a situation where 
um, we are doing an analysis and um, we find that, okay, it has some residues of an antibiotic which should not be there. Um, then we should be able to trace back to the farm of origin so that we can take the necessary action. If it's a disease and um, a, 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 an animal is transported to, to say a slaughter plant and upon anti-mortem inspection, we recognize that it might have a disease which might be of a, of a um, zoonotic nature or of a, an, an exotic nature or, or one that will um, potentially cause um, devastating effects on our livestock industry, then we will be able to trace that animal back to the farm of origin and immediately take the necessary steps to um, identify and stamp out the disease um, at source. It is now free to register under the National Animal Identification and Traceability System. The system is designed to safeguard the cattle and maintain food safety standards needed for a livestock sector aligned to international standards. At the end of October 2020, only 39,000 of the estimated 90,000 heads of cattle in Jamaica were registered under the program. For the news on PBCJ, I am Marlon Samuels. A fresh wave of COVID-19 related lockdowns are now sweeping sections of Europe. This has influenced a drop in global oil prices. Gabriel Thompson gives us this and other market details in the business report. In Thursday's trading session, the JSE combined index declined by 1,999 points to close at under 400,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 80 stocks, of which 78 advanced, 35 declined, and 16 traded firm. The junior market index declined by 15 points to close at under 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for 138 Students Living Jamaica, Access Financial Services, and Barita Investments Limited. Stocks declined for Caribbean Flavors and Fragrances Limited, Carreras Limited, and Community and Workers of Jamaica CCU Deferred Share. Trading firm were 1834 Investments Limited, AMG Packaging and Paper Company, and Cargo Handlers Limited. QWI Investments Limited was the volume leader with 3.2 million units, followed by Sagicor Group Jamaica Limited with 1.4 million units and Trans Jamaican Highway Limited with under 1 million units. Now for the foreign exchange. The US dollar on Thursday, November 5, ended trading at $146.82. The Canadian dollar sold for an average $113.96. The pound sterling traded for $192.89, and the euro ended trading at $176.38. Oil fell towards $40 a barrel on Friday as new lockdowns in Europe to halt surging COVID-19 infections sparked concern about the outlook for demand while markets remained on edge over drawn-out vote counting in the U.S. election. Italy recorded its highest daily number of infections on Thursday, and cases surged by at least 120,276 in the United States, the second consecutive daily record as the outbreak spreads across the country. Brent crude futures fell 60 cents to $40.33 a barrel. West Texas intermediate crude futures slipped 59 cents to $38.20 a barrel. It's now time for Financially Focused with financial coach Denise Williams. It's now time for Financially Focused with financial coach Denise Williams. Hi, I'm Denise Williams. I'm your financial coach. Now, in this time, we want to be really, really focused and smart with our money. However, let's, let's be honest. Yeah, we're going through some challenging times <laughs> no question you know it's it's not uh pretty and so the question i have for you is are your are you making financial decisions based on emotions or reason yeah boy it's a lot of stress going on but if you can get control of the stress and make better financial decisions you'll come out on the other side 
you know, wiser, better, stronger, more liquid. So how do you get over the emotions or get control, I should say? Because, you know, let's respect the emotions. They're teaching us something, fear, anger, shame, guilt. These are all, you know, hurt. These are all real emotions and they're teaching us something. So if you are not working with a coach or your pastor or, or a therapist, I would encourage you to do so. And at the same time for your money, what I can encourage you to do before you make a decision, read up on the data. You know, if you're not in a position to hire a financial coach like me to, to help you specifically, you know, let Google help you yeah? look up the information read on the data for whatever investing decision you're gonna make then you're gonna focus on what you can control can you save can you cut the amount of fees that you're paying the bank what can you control then you have to look at your long-term goals is buying a house important to you sending your children to school important to you your retirement is that important to you so these long-term goals are going to guide you in terms of the decisions that you make. So let me repeat, read the data. Don't make a decision on reading. Focus on what you can control. You can speak to your financial advisor or your banker. You can send them an email if you don't want to go into the branch. And you look at your long-term goals. You know, if you're, if you're single, if you have children, if you are married, if you are divorced, if you are widowed, if you are starting a brand new family, all of these decisions impact your long-term goals. And this is how you grab hold of the emotions that may be running away with you and you make decisions that are financially focused. I'm Denise Williams, your financial coach, and I hope you got value from this episode. Thanks, Denise. For more information on financial development and wealth building, head on over to financiallyfocused.com. And that's it for this edition of the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. Sensitive teeth are typically the result of worn tooth enamel or exposed tooth roots. As a result, hot or cold drinks, sweets, or even cold air can cause your teeth to hurt. Our resident dental expert, H.D. Jazz, tells us what to do if you have sensitive teeth. Ah, refreshing. Hi, I'm H.D. and I'm here with another dental tip. There are many people who can't enjoy a cool glass of water filled with ice because of sensitivity. There are lots of toothpaste on the market, and I'm often asked, does sensitive toothpaste really work? Yes, it does, but it doesn't work automatically. It's over time. It has a cumulative effect. That means it's going to take time. You won't feel the effects immediately. The second thing you need to know is that if you finish the tube and your teeth feel great, if you go back to something else, the sensitivity can return. So you have to continue to use the sensitive toothpaste. The nerve is in the center of the tooth and the sensitive toothpaste forms a barrier between the nerve in the center and the cold or the heat that the teeth are exposed to. Once that barrier goes, the sensitivity returns. Does sensitive toothpaste really work? Yes, it does. See you next time. In regional news, history was created in Thursday's general election when St. Vincent and the Grenadines Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez led the Unity Labour Party to a fifth consecutive victory. According to the Electoral Office's preliminary figures, the ULP had won nine of the 15 seats in the Parliament. This is an increase of three seats on the one-seat majority he had in the past two general elections. As the COVID-19 cases in St. Lucia mount, 
the public is asking questions about the island's health care capacity. The respiratory hospital on the island is reportedly at two-thirds capacity. That's the word from public health authorities during a press conference. We have more in this report. The respiratory hospital will hold 126 patients upon completion. The renovation of the medical facility was undertaken by the government of St. Lucia with help from the World Bank. According to the Permanent Secretary in the Health Ministry, Benson E. Mill, government's role in the project is complete, which places the hospital at almost two-thirds capacity. Emil disclosed that the World Bank component is 95% done and all that remains is the procurement of local equipment to make the rooms more habitable. He says health officials are awaiting the go-ahead from the bank. The submission is before the World Bank. We expect, we would expect approval or some response before the end of this week. And we have already, we are already in discussion with the contractor. So as soon as approval is granted, work will commence, you know, on cooling so that the, the facility can operate at full capacity. The shortfall at this point is 44 beds. The World Bank component is supposed to deliver 44 beds. Um, so we are, at capa we are at 82 bed capacity, making it almost, you know, two thirds of, of the capacity of the hospital. Medical officials say as the hospital approaches full capacity, only severely ill COVID-19 patients will be admitted for care and treatment. Medical Director of OKEUH and the Respiratory Hospital, Dr. Alicia Eugene Ford, says there are currently four spots available for persons experiencing complications with COVID-19. We're looking at um, 15 um, IC beds, but out of the 15 ICU beds right now, we have three ready for use. It's short time. So if somebody comes in now at the respiratory hospital and they need an ICU bed, we have three that are ready, three rest stations that are ready. What I mean ready is ventilators and all the different um, parts that are needed to have that bed functional. We have everything there for three stations. And we have an additional station that we can have ready in quick time if needed. So while we wait for the rest of the area, the ICU area, or the area of AMAC for ICU is being given to us by the World Bank. So I can tell you we have space for four, four cases. Executive Director of the OKEU and Respiratory Hospital, Nancy Francis, says the Health Ministry anticipated a surge in patients. Thus, the hospital undertook a manpower plan in preparation for the spike in cases. We had our, our human resource plan and we were looking at capacity as well. So as we move into the second wave, the, the second wave what we've done, we activated the human resource component. So we have increased our human, our human resource capacity at the, at the respiratory hospital. And we've also um, looked at the resources over at the Owen King EU hospital. And some of the services are shared, for example, as the, um, the administrative services. We share this service as well. Positive and suspected COVID-19 patients are currently being accepted at the respiratory facility. Suspected negative patients will be transferred to other health facilities for monitoring or may be isolated at home to prevent overcrowding at the hospital. Joachim De Placy, HDS News Force. Although all four of Trinidad and Tobago's reservoirs have started to recover, the Caroni Arena Dam is still very much behind. With less than two months before the official start of the dry season, measures are being implemented to reduce the projected shortfall. Sunil Lala has more in this report. Arena at this time is at 67% as compared to a long-term average of 81%. So we are still a bit below um, at that particular reservoir, which is our largest. The water level at the Karani Arena Dam has been a major concern for Wasa for some time. In early May, the levels were almost 30% behind the long-term average. Most recently in September, that gap stood at 28%, while all other reservoirs were less than 10% behind the long-term average. And although the gap for the Arena Dam has contracted, Wasa's CEO Alan Poonking says steps are in place to fill that reservoir in preparation for the dry season. Currently, we are drawing water from the Carney River, um, so no, we, we, we don't uh, depend on, on the arena reservoir at this time. At this time, we are filling it. So production is, is purely off of, of the runoff within, within the river itself. Currently, 
All other reservoirs are above their long-term average, with the Hollis Dam at 94% compared to an LTA of 78%. Navet is currently at 86% compared to an LTA of 81%, while the Hillsborough Reservoir in Tobago is at full capacity. Despite this, Mr. Poonking says there will be a rigid scheduling of water during the dry season. Based on the water that we do get um, from our reservoirs and our, our river intakes and so on, we will ensure that the regularity of the supply um, is as, as regular as we can with give, given the, the, the supply that we have available. Meanwhile, the WASA CEO says there will be no change to the water use restrictions, at least until next year. I think we'll have intention between now and the end of the year to relax that because we still have not, as you had, had, had observed, the reservoirs have still not um, fully recovered. Mr. Poon King notes that all treatment plants had been at reduced production rates for an extended period of time, but they have been nearing maximum production recently following the recovery of the reservoirs. Sonolala, TTT News. In sports, we go to cricket. The West Indies does not have a strong T20 record against New Zealand. This admission from all-rounder Rothman Powell comes ahead of the three T20 matches slated to be played in Christchurch. The first match will be played on November 27. Of the 13 times both teams have met, New Zealand won six and lost three matches. Three of the meetings between the teams have ended in a tie, while one ended in no result. However, Powell believes the current squad is strong enough to reverse their fortunes against New Zealand. And that's our package. Join us again on Monday, same time, same place, for more news and sports right here on PBCJ, the People's Station.